Amen. It's good to get your Bible out. Read it. Study it. Fellowship with it. Commune with God. Amen. Amen. Where am I even starting tonight? Uh, let's see here. I want to go to, I want to start in, in 1 Peter. It's where I want to start out. And uh, I got so excited working on some things relating to, to service tonight. I, I'm not sure where all my notes here start in this deal. I tell you what I want to do is uh, let's go to let's go to Second Thessalonians. Well, yeah, First Peter first, and then Second Thessalonians. We'll follow the notes here, but let's go to First Peter first. Uh, first Peter chapter one verse seven. The Bible says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing. Of Jesus Christ. And then 1 Peter chapter 4, if you would, turn there. Verse 12. Beloved, think it not a strange thing concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as that ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. So what we have here in 1 Peter, we have two places where Peter mentions that a trial by fire comes to us. And, and, and let me just say this, you will throughout your life, if you're going to live for the Lord, you will suffer loss. Now, just think about this. You, you could have, maybe you could have. Lived a life where you may have gained more money or more attention from people or more of this and more of that. But when you decided to live for the Lord, you tossed all that aside and you have lost things that maybe you could have gained in the world. But let me tell you something. That's the life that we choose. It, it will be, there will be suffering. You will lose things. You'll lose friends. You'll lose family members. You'll lose uh, maybe relationships with other people. You'll lose money. Okay, you'll lose opportunities and, and things like that. You'll suffer loss. But, and there will come times in your life where your faith is going to be tested. And it will be tested by fire. If you were just kind of think about this, what does fire do? What are some of the things that fire, or let's say that you're going through a fiery trial, what are some of the things that the fire would do for you? Caleb. Yeah. Huh? Burn. That'll work. Okay? It purify, cleanse. Okay? You know the old movies where they're going to dig the arrow out of some guy's chest cavity and they get a knife. What do they do with it? Stick it in the fire. Okay? Number one, that cleans all the, burns all the germs off of it. And then when they dig that arrow out, they're cauterizing. As they're pulling the arrow out. Of course, it starts out with a bottle of whiskey first. You know, okay? That's how they did it. But it, it purifies things. What else? It'll cleanse. It'll purify. It'll, Jared. It'll humble you. And then if you make it to the end, it'll make you stronger. Make you stronger. What, what, how do they temper? You were watching that this morning. He watches this show where these guys are making these knives and in a contest. And they, once they had the form of the sword or the knife they were making, you were watching it this morning, what were they doing with those, with those knives? Getting them red hot, and then what? Dip them in oil or water, and what would that do? Okay, but what else? What were they trying to do with those knives? They were trying to harden that metal. I knew it was there. Yeah, they were trying to harden that. That's how they harden those knives and whatever. Is that it's called tempering. They'll get it red hot and then immediately pull it out and stick it in oil and cool it down. And that changes the molecular structure of that. Then they'll do it again and do it again and repeat that process until those things, then they they'd have a test. How do they test that, Caleb? What else? 
How would they test the hardness of those knives and axes and things they were made? They would take them. They would have a block of ice. ice. And some guy would go wham like that and chop through that ice. And if that if that blade was hardened enough, it would withstand that test. It wouldn't have cracks in it. Remember that? Now it's all coming back to you now, isn't it? Of course, he watches this early in the morning when he gets up, and there's just like nothing there. There's a big haze there. It's kind of like me first thing in the morning. But anyway, that's what it does, all right? So a fiery trial is going to happen in your life. Now, the gist of kind of where I'm going with this is that I think that in the last days, before we are taken out, we go through a fiery trial. That's what I believe. Okay? It is to try you. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I want you to turn there. Okay? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let's see where we're going. All right, we're heading in the right direction. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. A couple things I want to say here. Number one, as Christians, we grow in faith, and we want our faith to increase. Amen? But number two, your faith is nothing if you leave out charity. And I like the King James because it uses the word charity and it is the right word. Charity is that what they, you hear these guys talk about agape love. Okay? That is the love that gives without an expectation of return. If you decide to mow your neighbor's grass, and you did that in hopes that maybe he'll do something for you. You didn't do it out of love. Okay? Linda, your neighbors, I love your neighbors. You got awesome neighbors. When you went down to Jim's mom and dad's, you come back and found out not only had your yard been mowed, but a service came and did it. And who paid for it? Your neighbors. Why'd they do that? They love her. Okay? And I commended them for that kind of love while they were here in front of everybody. Okay? Here we have lost people acting the way Christians are supposed to act. We're supposed to give and do for people without an expectation that they're going to do something back for us. That's real love. That's charity. And the charity of every one of you, all toward each other, abounded. Means we're supposed to increase in it, not decrease from it. You say, well, I did something for so-and-so, but they never returned a favor. Well, then you did it wrong. You did it with the wrong attitude. Well, I give money to that church, but I never get anything out of it. You're giving for the wrong reason. And any, any of these TV preachers who are telling you, Oh, if you give now, God will return this to you. You are giving for the wrong reason. Give because you love. Give because it's the right thing to do. Give out of charity. Don't give in order to get something back, either from the church or your neighbor or somebody or God. Because if you do, you're doing it for the wrong reason. That's, my, that's another sermon. Verse 4, so that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Will we endure tribulations? That's what it says. Be ready for it. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also, what? He didn't say which ye also get rich. He didn't say that you're going to get your best life now. I don't want, if you offer me my best life now, I won't take it. I want the best life later. Amen? We don't eat the dessert first. Eat the green beans, kids. Eat the green beans and the spinach and the cauliflower and the pinto beans. 
Then you get the dessert. Amen. Amen. So now he, this, watch what he says, verse 6. Seeing it is righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. There's his revelation again. With his mighty angels. In, in what? Flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Tribulation, fiery trial is coming. Turn to Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8. They've updated the app that I use to project that on the screen. And they've got it to where I can make the text bigger if I want. Or I can make it real tiny so that you've got to get your Bible out. I like it. I'm going to send them a letter to tell them thank you. Revelation chapter 8 verse 5. Watch this. Watch what happens here. This is the trumpet judgments. The trumpet judgments. When we are raptured, we're waiting to hear what? The trumpet. Paul specifically said in 1 Corinthians 15, the last trump is when they were to be taken up. Now, some people got different ideas about that, but I think the last trump means the last trump. All right? So if the angel took the censer, verse 5 of chapter 8, and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. The seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. Uh, and they were cast upon the earth. The third part of the trees was burned up. And all the green grass was burned up. Now, a ask the question. Was there ever a time when God, another time when God rained hail and fire down? When did he do it? Sodom and Gomorrah. When was another time he did it? Huh? One of the plagues. Down upon Egypt. Where was God's people at that time? In Goshen. But they were kept safe from that. It did not affect them. Alright? Did not affect them. Please, do not think that a fiery trial is going to be a strange thing. That something went wrong. Please think and arm yourselves with this mind. That there very could well be a fiery trial that is to try you. Be prepared for it. Don't be so proud and arrogant and cocky in your walk with Christ that you think no bad thing is ever going to happen to you. Because I'm telling you that brothers and sisters throughout history, bad things have happened to them. Amen? So anyway, now verse 8, the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. The third part of the sea became blood. Was there ever a time when the waters was turned to blood? Ten plagues. And where was God's people? In Goshen, kept safe. Okay? Uh, let's see, verse 9. And the third part of the creatures... Uh, which were in the sea had, and had life, died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Verse 10, the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. Notice that all these things, these trumpets, all these things relate to fire. The first one was hail and fire. The second one, a great mountain burning with fire. The third trumpet sounds, and now we have a great star burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. The name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. You know what that reminds me of? The vine of Sodom. The vine of Sodom produces Wormwood, produces bitterness. In verse 12, and see, the, all this is fire. Verse 12, when the fourth angel sounded, the third part of the sun was smitten. The sun is fire. And the third part of the moon, the third part of the stars, so as 
the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of the heaven, saying with a loud voice, Whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. But it just, to me, it just stands out that these first four trumpets sound and every one of them have to do with fire of some kind. A fiery trial, which is to try you. Okay? Now, I always look for a story. I always look for typology, a picture that God has drawn in His Bible of how this works or what it looks like. And I, there are several, but one of them sticks out in my mind. Turn to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Mm, 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 mm. Um, and when you get there, let's turn to 2 Thessalonians 2. Because I think they are connected. I think they are mated together. Isaiah, seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. And I think that God links stories and verses together so, and gives us an understanding. So 2 Thessalonians 2 tells us, in verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except it come of falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. It says specifically, Bible says specifically, that that day, in our gathering together unto the Lord, that day will not happen except there is a falling away first and the man of sin is going to be revealed. That man of sin is the beast, the Antichrist. What is his number, by the way? 603 score and 6. Now look at Daniel chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of what? Gold. What did Peter say about the fiery trial? More precious than the trial of your faith is more precious than gold. So we have three young men standing here, standing before an image of gold. And they've decided to stand on their faith rather than choosing to bow before the gold. Who in here has ever made a decision in life similar to that? Raise your hand. You have chosen to stand on your faith rather than choosing, let's say, even to bow before an image. Okay? A preacher I know said that his dad encouraged him to join the Masonic Lodge. So he did. And uh, he said, I didn't know what I was doing. He said, I joined the lodge. And he said, they brought me in and had this little ceremony. He said, they blindfolded me and they told me to kneel. So I knelt. They had me say a bunch of words, so I said the words. And then they removed the blindfold, and he said, I was knelt before a man that they called Worshipful Master. And he said, I was lost, and I knew that was wrong. He said, I didn't last long there. He made a choice not to bow, not to fall before another master. Because you can't have two of them. You only have one. So here we have an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. Three score is how much? JR, how much is three score? 60. How much is a score? 20. Very good. Unless you play basketball, then it's only. Okay. It's 20. So, it's, so we have 60 cubits by six cubits. You think that's an accident. You think that that doesn't mean anything. Of course it does. God put it in His Word. He wants you to understand that this image of gold is a picture, a foreshadow of the Antichrist. Because they're going to make an image to the beast. And the beast himself, that image, is going to cause everyone that will not worship that image to be beheaded, to be killed. 
And he's going to cause everybody to receive a mark in the right hand of the forehead with that number, 603 score and 6. 60 cubits and 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. To look at verse 4. Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations and tongue, or nations and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet. What's a cornet? It's a trumpet. The trumpet's going to sound and these people are going to fall before this image. The cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackment, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music. You fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whoso falleth not down. See the falling taking place here? They're falling, Brother George. They're falling. There is a falling coming. Okay? Falleth not down and worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning what? Fiery furnace. It's a trial of faith here. You're either going to stand on your faith in what you trust, or you're going to fall before the image. So he says in verse 7, Therefore at that time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, Sacrament, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So we skip on down to verse 15. Now, if you be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, he says it again the flute, the harp, the sacrament, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God? I like that in your King James. Capitalizes that letter G there. Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. You see, their faith was being tried here. How many fake, phony church members are there around the world? How many people claiming to be Christian are going to fall on that day? Because they were threatened, because they were told... That if they don't, they're going to be thrown in the fiery furnace. Shoot. We've got people now who are making, who are falling away from God with lesser threats. You can't talk about Jesus. You'll lose your time. Hey, the court ordered you to issue gay marriage license to these two sodomites. And that lady, what was it, out in Kentucky said, I'm not doing it. Notice how the world treated her. They dug into her past and they found out every ill thing that she had ever done. And people all over, even all over Facebook were going off saying, here's this woman who's been married I don't know how many times and she's a slut, she's an adulterer, she's a whore. Who is she to well, lecture us about marriage? Yeah, but she got redeemed. And she decided that her faith was more important than anything else. It didn't matter what she had done. All of us are sinners, are we not? Are we afraid the devil's going to pull out our past against us and use it against us? Don't be. Because even if the devil does, your conscience has been cleaned by the Holy Spirit of God. You have a clean conscience, don't you? Even though you know what you've done, you know you've been forgiven in God's eyes. And that's what matters. Stand on your faith, people. Don't let the devil threaten you. Don't let him try to turn you back. There's nothing worth going back for. Lot's wife tried it. Amen? Speaking of fiery trials, Lot. God sent down a fiery judgment upon Sodom, and God <laughs> saved Lot out of it. Lot stood, the Bible calls him just Lot. Meaning Lot had been justified by God from all of his sins. He stood on his faith. So he says in verse 17, If it be so, our God, whom, who we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, 
Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. People at some point, young people, young people, at some point, young people, listen, at some point, establish it in your mind and in your heart that no matter what, you're going to choose God over anything in this world that's offered to you and over any threat that's made, you're going to choose to serve God. Cassie Bernal. Am I saying her name right? Does anybody know? Anybody know who that is? You know who that is, Sister Pam? Columbine High School. And the two guys going around shooting people were targeting Christians. And they specifically said to her, are you a Christian? And she said, yes. And they shot and killed her. By the way, does anybody know? I'm, I'm just going to show you the spiritual part of this. Does anybody know how many people died in that shooting? One teacher and 12 students. Dun, dun, dun. One teacher and twelve students. Okay, I just I think there's a spiritual thing going on there. I think those guys were full of devils. Okay, and at least one of those students we know for sure said, "Yes, I'm a Christian." If you will confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. Amen to that. Okay? Settle it in your mind. That it's God or nothing. Is God going to save you and protect you from the fiery trial which is to try you? He can. But even if he doesn't. Even if he doesn't. I'm still not going to bow to that image. Amen? Still not going to give in. So in verse 19, then was Nebuchadnezzar, <clears throat> you get ready, okay? Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. So they took that furnace, and whatever the standard temperature was, they multiplied it by seven. So let's say it's 700 degrees Fahrenheit. They heated it up to 4,900 degrees Fahrenheit. That will burn you. Okay? That's hot. Seven times. I keep saying that for a reason. Okay? Uh, and he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. And then those men were bound in their coats, their hosen, their hats, and their other garments were cast in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How? Just think about that. God turned the judgment and the wrath of Nebuchadnezzar against Nebuchadnezzar's own, own men. So anyway, in, in verse 23, And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose. What happened to the ropes that were binding them? Burn off! I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like, say it, the Son of God, not a Son of the Gods. Not Mwanawa Miungu. 
for our Kenyan friends that are listening. Mwanawamungu, the Son of God. He's there, right there with them. While the furnace is heated seven times. Psalm 12. Turn there. What's in Psalm 12? Purified. Seven times. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified. That's why the fiery furnace was heated seven times hotter. The words of the Lord. Number one, your Bible. Number two, your DNA. Who wrote your DNA? In thy book, all my members are written. What David said. The words of the Lord are in you, in every cell in your body. And they're going to make it through the fire. Purified seven times. By the way, that number seven, we studied that here not too long ago on a Sunday. That number seven represents completion, sanctification. And when God cleans something, how many times did Naaman dip in the River Jordan? Seven times, not eight, not six, not five, seven times. And when he came up the seventh time, he was clean, wasn't he? Uh, the high priest was to take the blood and sprinkle it on the Ark of the Covenant exactly seven times. And that number represents purification and the completion of purification. When God purifies you, when God cleans you, when God sanctifies you, it, you are sanctified and it's done forever. Does, no other work needs to be done. Amen? God's work is complete. God's work is done. It's finished. It's tried. It's pure. Proverbs 17.3, the, the finding pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord trieth the hearts. Look at that. Look how we connected them together. The finding pot means like a refinery. The, the heated pot that you put silver in. So that, and why do you put silver in a heated pot? Huh? So it'll melt. What for? Get the impurities out. They, they come up to the top. That's the dross that is taken away so that what remains is pure silver. How many of you want that in your life? Proverbs 27, 21. As the fighting pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so is a man to his praise. You see it? God, I'm not where I want to be. I'm not. I'm, God's still got work to do in me. And I want him to do that work. And I recognize, according to the word of God, that that requires the refinery, the furnace, the fiery trial. That's how God does it. And he does it. That he, he gives us these beautiful illustrations in the Bible. Things that we know, things that we've seen in life. Some of you may have actually seen someone purify gold or silver or some sort of metal by fire. Okay? You've seen it with your eyes. You know how it works. And God does it exactly that way for us. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It is no accident that that furnace was hot seven times. Because the words of the Lord are in them. And, there, and who was with them? The Son of God, who is the Word of God, in that fire with them. Sixteen oh four to sixteen eleven is how many years? Seven years. 
Because the commandment came out in 1604. Let's, let's translate the Bible. And they worked on it seven years. They refined it. It took them seven years. Because they worked in a refining fashion. One group working on a section. And then they, when they were done, they passed it to another group who peer-reviewed their work and refined their work. So that by the time the Word of God, every word, had made it through all of those groups and committees and gone through all the processes, took it seven years. And at the end of seven years, they said, this is it. This is what God has given us to do. And it's complete. And I think this book's perfect. I think it is. Isaiah 48 verse 9. For my name's sake will I defer mine anger. And for my praise will I refrain for thee. That I cut thee not off. Behold I have refined thee. But not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. For mine own sake. Even for mine own sake will I do it. For how should my name be polluted. And I will not give my glory unto another. We have all done things. That has polluted the name of God and Christ, haven't we not? And that, if you, you can, the people who really love Jesus, that bothers them. That even though they may have had their sins forgiven, it bothers them. That they brought shame and reproach to the cause of Jesus Christ by their action. It should bother you. Because that shows that you love the name of Jesus. You love your Lord. And you don't want anything to bring reproach to him and to his name. And so God says, what I'm going to do for you, I'm doing for my own sake. For my name's sake. Because you polluted my name. And so now I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. I have refined thee. Exodus 19. You can turn there. See, I decided to chase this word down through the scriptures. Furnace. Okay? Furnace. Mm -mm -mm. Exodus 19. Verse 16, it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount. Stop right here. Stop right here. I just noticed something. We just read it. That when the angel in Revelation 8 took the fire off the altar... The angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it in the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Same things going on here. It came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain. The voice of the trumpet exceeding. By the way, when Jesus comes, what is he, how is he going to come back? He's coming in the clouds. We were told to specifically look for him coming in the clouds. And here he is right here. It just seems like... When Jesus shows up, it's with clouds. He's establishing that pattern for you. Now, for whatever this is worth, I have this little theory that says when the Antichrist shows up, there's no clouds. Okay, Maybe I'm wrong, but that's just kind of what I'm thinking. But anyway, we'll know it when we see it. Amen? Okay? So, the tr but we have, we have the Lord coming in the clouds. We have the thunders and the lightnings. And uh, we have the trumpet sounding. You see it? The trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. Amen. And they uh, stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a what? Furnace. There it is. The whole mount quaked. There's the earthquake. Just like in Revelation 8. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake and God answered him by a voice. There's the voice. And the Lord came down. Look at that. The Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mountain. Moses went up. 
The Lord, listen, the Lord's coming down and we're going up. Hey Amen. When the trumpet sounds and the furnace is burning and the ground is quaking and the lightnings and the thunderings are going on. It's going to scare a lot of people. Don't be alarmed. When that day happens, amen? Where else can I go? Boy, I got so many places. Go to, uh, by the way, the note that I made here is the falling away takes place first before Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get to meet Jesus in the fiery furnace. The, fall, the falling away took place first. Okay? What time is it? 8 o'clock? After 8 o'clock? Mm, 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 mm. Turn to Jeremiah very quickly, and then I'll let you go. No, no, turn to Ezekiel 22. I like this better. Ezekiel 22. You're going to like this. Remember the words of the Lord are pure words as silver. Look at this. Ezekiel 22, 17. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, the house of Israel is to me become dross. What is dross? That waste in the metal that doesn't, it's that stuff in the metal that doesn't belong there. The son the Israel's become dross. All thy, all they are brass and tin and iron and lead in the midst of the furnace. Look at that. They are even the dross of silver. Yeah. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because ye are all become dross, behold, therefore I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem. As they gather silver and brass and iron and lead and tin in the midst of the furnace to blow the fire upon it to melt it. So will I gather you in mine anger and in my fury and I will leave you there and melt you. Yea, I will gather you and blow upon you in the fire of my wrath. You shall be melted in the midst thereof as silver is melted in the midst of the furnace. So shall ye be melted in the midst thereof and you shall know that I the Lord have poured out my fury upon you. Okay. God is going to have to take us and melt us so that dross comes out. We're going to have to be in the furnace. Because when I meet Jesus for the first time, I would really like to be clean. Amen? You ever thought about that? Meeting Jesus for the first time. If the president called and said that he wants to come to our church. And I was going to meet him for the first time. I would not be in my Bermuda shorts. With my sleeveless t-shirt on. I would be wearing a suit and a tie. Right? Right? He's just the president. When I meet Jesus for the first time, I want to be clean. Okay? I want to be clean. I want to be right. I want to be purified. And he has a way for that to be. And it's the fiery trial that is to try you. Okay? I probably, I don't, I, I don't think I've spoken enough on that. I think there's a lot more to it in the scriptures. You study some more on that if you think God is leading you to. And I again, I, I, I'm trying to look into the future and see something through the eyes of the Bible. And I see through a glass darkly. Okay? So I don't think I got it all. But it wouldn't hurt us to be armed in our minds to be ready. Amen? It wouldn't hurt us. Let's stand to our feet. Lord, I remember being young and hearing preachers preach about the end times and being scared. And so, Lord, I can understand anybody, young or old, thinking on these things and being scared, being frightened. I get it. But, Lord, you have not given us a spirit of fear, and I just believe. Like these three young men, Lord, you filled them with your Holy Spirit. There's no doubt. 
that as they stood there before King Nebuchadnezzar, they had a spirit of peace on them. And they were ready to yield over their lives for your cause, knowing that there would be glory on the other side. And yet, Father, you spared them. And you blessed them in a, with the presence of Jesus himself. So, Father, help us to think on these things. Help us, dear God. We know, Father, that on that day, on any day, where we are going to be in the fire, we know that you're going to be there with us. You never leave us. Never forsake us. We can always count on you to keep us through these times. And, Father, some people, even here tonight, may be going through that right now. Lord, give them that peace in knowing that you are there with them. And you've never left their side. And you'll always be there for them, no matter what. Father, just bless your word. Honor your word in our hearts tonight. Help us, dear God, to want to know more about things that are coming. If for no other reason, God, than that we endure the sufferings and the afflictions and the tribulations that we endure here on this earth. That we endure it for your kingdom's sake. Lord, purify your people tonight. Lord, glorify them, purify them. Burn out all the dross that's in our lives, Father, because that causes us to not shine. So, Lord, just burn out all the sins, all the transgressions, all the iniquities that we have. And clean us out and make us whole. Get us ready for our first time we meet you. Bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen.